So guys, it's going to be a big summer transfer window wise. Everyone gets excited about which players are going to move, but it looks like this year is going to be really busy in terms of managers. We've got Barcelona looking for a coach, Bayern Munich, Liverpool, possibly Chelsea, Man United, Newcastle as well. So how do you see the, the window playing out? Any particular names that you think are going to be top of people's list? Well, we know that some of those clubs you name there may not change managers, but we know some of them are. We know Barcelona are looking. And I think it's been interesting that, you know, the Mikel Arteta links all kind of came. It, it struck me as though they were coming from a place of Barcelona, sort of let's get someone to write this for us and kind of put it out there, you know. Because when um, when that story first came out a few weeks ago, I think it was late January, early February, it was this idea that oh, Mikel Arteta's told his backroom staff he wants to go to Barcelona. There's, there's nothing in that at all at the time. But Mikel gets asked about it at the presser. The, it's a testing know, up, testing a what? Yeah, this it? idea then gets sort of percolated around the, the the industry of well, would he go? And it starts a debate about all this kind of thing. So I think there's a, I think there's one or two clubs doing that without a kind of real knowledge of specifically who's available and and, and how it how it will work out. I mean, it reminds me of like you know typical transfer window where one big move happens and then it yeah. frees up two or three other clubs to, you know, it's a domino effect, isn't it? It feels like it might be a bit like that. This it's interesting though that usually that list of clubs that you mentioned in a normal summer, if they were looking for a manager, you would think would have the pick, wouldn't you? You're talking about some of the biggest clubs in Europe that if you came, if that club came calling to any given manager, that's just a done deal because you know, why would you want, not want to take that job? But if you've got three or four or even five or six clubs all looking at the same pool of managers, it complicates things quite a lot. And then you've got a situation where now, say if you're Man United or Chelsea who may be a little bit on the fence about changing managers, do you stick with the guy that you've already got because you can't go and get the guy you really want because he's interested in going somewhere else? It just complicates things massively. And you're talking about the main guy at a football club. It's not trying to sign a right back or a left back. You, you, you're building your entire football department really around this one guy. You've got to get the appointment right. And that's a good point about, about Barcelona, I think, is that you know four or five years ago, before all these economic levers were getting pulled and the whole financial picture was as bleak as it is now, you, you, you know, they, they could go and pick it. You know, if, if Barcelona wanted Arsenal's manager, they would have gone and, gone and got Arsenal's manager. The fact of the matter is now the financial situation has changed and also in Arteta's case in particular, he's got he's moulded that club in, in terms of the internal structure of it, almost in his own image now. You know, they, they went from a model where Arsene Wenger was the sole arbiter, decision maker across everything, to they had nine department heads and they had created this whole infrastructure that was supposed to have a head coach placed within it. With Arteta in the last four years, they got rid of all that. Yeah. And they've gone back to Arteta and one or two others around him and that key decision. And he's not going to get that at Barcelona. And if he's looking at Barcelona at a club at the moment and think, well, I've got fairly solid financial picture, young squad pulling in the right direction, they may or may not win the league this year, either way the team looks like it's going to progress for the next couple of years. Of course he's got the, 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 the links to Barcelona as a younger younger man and he may well end up there one day but this summer doesn't really feel like Do you think he's got that in his, in his plan though? Do you think when he's, he's looking at his career and he's trying to map it out, he thinks that eventually is that where he wants to get to? I think, I think he will manage that club at some point in his career. Because, it, because the other part of that is that, as cushy as he's probably got everything at Arsenal at the moment, the thing you keep hearing about these jobs is they don't come around yeah. very often. So that, that's the thing you see because I don't think he can turn Barcelona down. I, I agree in the sense that everything is in his favour at Arsenal, but obviously he's got Man City on his doorstep at Arsenal as well. If you're at Barcelona, generally you've got Real Madrid and maybe Atletico, that's your rivals, and I think Barca have always got more opportunities to bounce back quickly because they've got the same depth of competition in Spain. You're right, the situation at the club right now is a, is, is a mess. I've been told that Thomas Tuchel's in there, they're looking at as well, they're looking at De Zerbi, they're looking at other coaches, but Arteta, whether it was just a clever ploy to see his intentions, and he knocked it straight out pretty much straight away. But, he was livid about it, by the way, behind but, the scenes. But was he livid, livid because it's absolute non-starter, livid because it's put pressure on him to actually deal with the possibility that he might be off with the Barcelona job? Well, I, I think another element of this is who replaces Pep whenever Pep goes, no. because that same day, that Arteta came out very strongly against the whole Barcelona thing. I actually asked him, it was the same week that Klopp announced he was leaving, and obviously in that whole announcement, Klopp said, I'd never manage another club in England, and I thought, why not ask Arteta that? Because, all right, he's not been there that long, but he goes on and on about how you know much affinity he has love for Arsenal, and it's Arsenal, 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 and there's that video that does the rounds about, oh, when he was on the City bench, he never celebrated a goal against yeah. Arsenal. So I said, well, okay, Mikel, did you see yourself ever managing another club in England, thinking he 
follow that line? And he gave this answer that was so non-committal about, well, I'm a young manager, I'm whatever he is, 41, I've got a long career ahead of me, who knows, never say never and all this. And, and it does strike me, and you guys will know better than me, but if Pep goes next summer, say, Arteta oh, is quite, it's, I think that, surely he's the obvious candidate. I think that ship sailed from, from the stuff that's getting said behind the scenes. I think that was probably in City's plans at one stage when he was there, and I think they, it was probably part of the negotiations when, they were talk, when Arteta was talking to Arsenal, to say to Arteta, if you hang on, you would be front and centre for this job once Pep goes. Obviously, we can't promise when Pep's going to go because he's done so much that he's going to choose when, when and where that is. I think that shit may have sailed now. The, the, there was a little bit of animosity as well, wasn't there, between City and Arsenal at the time. Yeah, There's also the issue true. as well that if you go to City, this issue of the 115 charges hasn't been addressed. They might be in a different division by then. Probably not, but you never know. This, this, if you're taking the Man City do you want to know that they are the Man City of now. And also, mm. do you want to be the guy that follows Pep Guardiola? We've seen what happened at, at Man United. We've seen to a lesser extent what's happened at Arsenal after Wenger. There's going to be an issue at Liverpool this year with Jurgen Klopp going because yeah. to replace Jurgen Klopp, I, I don't think there's ever there's a manager in the Premier League era that has had the same absolute bond and connection with the club's fans that he's had. So Alex Ferguson never had it at United. They're always detractors of Pep. So Alex Ferguson certainly post the Glazer takeover. There's obviously a lot of friction at times between Pep and the Man City fans because he constantly complains about the atmosphere and the lack of history. But Klopp and Liverpool, Klopp has kind of he's turned Liverpool into this this incredible unit on and off the pitch, and to replace his success and his personality is just. It's a massive challenge, and obviously Xabi Alonso's the favourite amongst the fans, but Xabi Alonso's a totally different character at Jurgen Klopp. He's not got the same outgoing personality. He's very thoughtful, very studious. Mm. He's obviously got a connection with the fans from having played them on the Champions League, but he's not Jurgen Klopp. But following Klopp, following Guardiola, these are, these are jobs that, fantastic jobs on the face of it, but almost impossible jobs yeah. in many ways. And like, you know, it, was, it was being said, wasn't it, when, when Fergie retired, that you don't, you don't want to be the first guy after... Fergie, what would be the second guy? It's the same is true after Arsenal after Wenger that you don't that you you kind of you you foresee in this dip because how can you carry on? How can you build on what Klopp's done and go and you know win the Champions League straight away, or win the Premier League? There is going to be an inevitable drop, whoever you get. So you don't want to be the first guy. You want to be the guy that picks it up from a relatively low ebb to take them forward. I mean, it's obviously not happened at United, but it did happen a little bit at Arsenal. Yeah, it did. But if, but if you're, I mean, I heard, I remember hearing last summer that De Zerbi was kind of felt he was very front and centre of place Guardiola whenever that day came. Yeah. He felt he was getting, from what I was told, he felt he was getting some positive noises that if he, you know, as you say, Guardiola will determine the timing of his own departure. Yeah. But whenever that is, apparently De, De Zerbi had been given the sort of impression that if you just sit tight at Brighton, we'll come and get you when the time comes. Yeah. Now, things have moved on a lot in that time. But that. could you, if you're De Zerbi, turn that down? You know, if you were in a city, I know what you're saying about City, yeah. but if you're De Zerbi, would you not just take the punt? Because yeah, the complication like, there is, if Liverpool and Man United come calling first, you turn them down to wait for Man City, yeah. and I don't think you can. Mm. You, like you were saying, Rob, certain jobs don't come along very often, and I think there are certain jobs in world football, there's Barcelona, Real Madrid, Man United, maybe Liverpool, that you just cannot turn down. They are this and that, they are the biggest clubs in the world, and I think if they come calling, if you turn it down, you never get the chance again, and I think Roberto De Zerbi, as you will all know, he's the guy that everybody's talking about, so United are looking around just in case they have to replace Ten Hag, and De Zerbi's high on the list. And, you know, personally, I'm, I'm thinking, has he done enough? Has he managed a big enough club to merit that, that kind of link? But you look at what he's done at Brighton this year. He lost his two mid midfielders, McAllister and Caicedo, gone. And Cesar's missed virtually all the season. Evan Ferguson's been injured all the time. Matoma's out now. And he's still got them on the fringe of the European place. He's done an incredible job. But, but can he wait for City? If those clubs come corner, I just don't think he can. The thing about De Zerbe, on the face of it, seems like quite a good fit for a lot of these clubs. I think the problem he's got is that among the, the people who are going to make these decisions at United and Liverpool and, and City, he's been seen to be setting fire to his reputation a little bit with the fuss he's been cause, causing at Brighton, particularly after that game at Roma, coming out straight away and saying it's not my fault, it's the chairman's fault, he needs to buy better players. Mm. Hierarchies at big clubs are not going to want to deal with that. They want managers who are going to come and slot into their structure and abide by their rules. And, and I'm not suggesting that managers shouldn't be allowed to, to challenge owners and scouting departments and stuff. But it's an added complication. If you've got a manager who's coming out every week and saying, I haven't got the right players, speak to the chairman, the chairman needs to buy me better players. People at Man United and Liverpool and City are going to be looking at and thinking, is, 
is that worth the hassle? Has he done enough to warrant what he's going to cause behind the scenes? It's been Mourinho, isn't it? It's it is. It. It's the football without the fuss. Yeah. That's what they want. Which, which actually brings in Gareth Southgate into that conversation because he's probably the opposite end of that, isn't he? He's the absolute, well, that's his image, isn't it? He's the absolute sort of well, model statesman, but are you going to get the quality of football? There's three names I want to chuck in there. Southgate, Nagelsmann, Didier Deschamps, all international coaches who may all leave their post this year, but they're not really getting linked with the big jobs. I mean, United have kind of assessed Southgate, but I, I don't really think he's going to get the United job for different reasons. Nagelsmann's been kind of linked with the Liverpool job, but again, will he leave the Germany role? But you've got three high-profile coaches that have got good track records, but they're out of the club game. And they start with Southgate. I mean, we know that his situation at the FA is kind of in the balance, and I've been told that, I'm sure you've heard the same, that he doesn't know what he wants to do yet. Mm. You know, he nearly went after the World Cup, but if he became available after the, the Euros, he's done a fantastic job with England. But when I wrote that last week that he was linked with the United States, that he's being assessed, the, the reaction was so negative because he's perceived as being a, a cautious manager but great relationship with players statesman like he's you know he's, he's turned around a difficult job in England but again he, he seems almost toxic to fans because it's Gareth Southgate and England do actually play some pretty good stuff as a general rule mm -hmm. now not always and it's I know that the uh, eternal criticism of him that he's too conservative he's too cautious but you know look at the goals that they've scored okay yes against the lesser teams but you go back five years ten years look how England struggled against uh, you know similar teams in those kind of matches. I mean, I think, from my understanding of where Southgate is, you're right, I think he's torn over what he would want to do, and I think the, 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 the uh, performance at the Euros this summer will go, obviously, a long way to deciding that. What I have heard, though, is that internally he's doing quite a lot of the planning for 2026, and you could look at that one or two ways. People who tell me that sort of think, oh, you know, taking from that, maybe he is thinking of carrying on, but he's the kind of guy that will do the job up until the last day and go. Remember, he's got a contract in December as well, so he may, he may say post-tournament, I'm going to hang around if somebody wants me for the transition because he's been manager for, what will it be, eight years, um, and somebody might want me to just help through the September fixtures and then go or sail off to the sunset or whatever. But the one thing I did hear about um, the Man United interest was that part of that is based on culture. This whole idea that you know one of Manchester United's biggest problems is the, the, this lack of a winning culture, this lack of professionalism and culture. The fact that some of those players, I mean, that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer interview did the other week where he's saying, oh, you know, certain players didn't want to catch in the club, yeah. and when that day when he knew he was getting fired at Watford, he was going around the dressing room going, who wants to play? You know, the, yeah. mad really. He should have done something about that at the time, but anyway, back to Southgate. But why? <laughs> but why? Well, true. But but the point I'm making is that what Southgate's biggest legacy will be with England is the culture that he's put in they want to be there they want to play for the country and also he's very close to Dan Ashworth as we know yeah he's also got a good relationship with Dave Brailsford that goes you know leaders in football conferences and so there's a there's a real unit there already and I think just to kind of be a bit mischievous here if Gareth Southgate is your manager in the Premier League you put yourself front of the queue to get Harry Kane from Bayern Munich from maybe Jude Bellingham from Real Madrid if they decide to come back to the Premier League because his relationship with these players mm. and other players and even Marcus Rashford you know he's one of the few coaches that's been able to get something out of Marcus Rashford so if you want a manager that can get the best out of the players and create a healthy environment, he's your guy. The downside is... Aaron not, Maguire gets a new five-year deal. Yeah, he's, not winning, he's not winning anything. He's been able to get club game for 15 years. And when, when United hired Louis van Gaal, that was a problem because he'd been out of the club game for four years, didn't know how to condition a team for a season, didn't know anything about the market, didn't know anything about you know, the agents. Things change. So that is a big issue that Seth would have to address. But I still think that it's an outsider, but the timing as well, end of June, July... United need to make a decision before then, but... Well, there has to be a doubt about it. It's, it's, I mean, I, I, I am a fan of Southgate, uh, particularly from the, the work that he's done with England, because I, it's a, obviously I cover them, but I've seen the transition yeah. firsthand, and I'm, and I'm old enough, as we all are, to remember how bad England were and how, how dire it got, and just on a basic level, the players who just did not want to be there. Yes, they've fallen short, you could argue, particularly in Qatar, Winnable quarter-final again, well, obviously France a fantastic team, but a winnable quarter-final and maybe Gareth to take the handbrake off in the final of the Euros. And all that, I get all of those criticisms. But there does come back to a club level. Can United, I mean, United appointed Solskjaer when he'd been relegated with Cardiff. Are they going to appoint another manager who got relegated with Middlesbrough? Is the, that the, the pedigree? Is that good enough? The one thing I would say about Ineos is that they are keeping an eye on fan reaction more than perhaps you'd expect. And you're talking there about when you wrote that story, the fan reaction, the negative fan reaction. I'm sure lots of people listening to this will go, well, what's that got to do with it? If he's the right guy for the job, you hire him. Well, in terms of what Ineos are thinking, I think they are thinking that it, that is part of the, the process that they are determined to make not only good decisions, but also decisions that are quite 
popular. And you can't have a situation where, and this is an extreme example, but Benitez at Everton, where perhaps Benitez would have been a great manager for Everton, but you start on the back foot so quickly that you can never, ever win in round. And Ineos have, have overseen a deal where basically all the United fans thought that the Glazers were going and they've basically paid for the Glazers to stay on the face of it, a very unpopular decision. They'll be looking at fan reaction and when they're looking at managers thinking, can we get, even if Southgate's the right guy for the job, can we sell that to the fans? I think the answer at the moment is, is probably no. But the problem is, clubs that listen to fans don't tend to succeed. I remember when Man City sat Mancini back in I think 2013 and the fans were totally against that because they love Mancini, but look what's happened at Man City no, you're since. Right. You've got to make a cold-headed decision what is best for the club. Now, I'm not saying Gareth Southgate is the best decision for Man United, but what I do know is that they are assessing their options because Eric Ten Hag has obviously got a lot to prove this year, but they may end up keeping him because of the cost of getting rid of him. But the reason why they're assessing their options, as we mentioned before, is that already three of the biggest clubs in Europe are looking for coaches yeah. and United need to know that if they do make a change they've got plans in place and if plan A is De Zerbi and he goes somewhere else if plan B is Thomas Frank again it's unlikely but certain coaches you know Graham Potter's another one all these managers that are doing the rounds by the time United make a decision three of them might have gone so it may have end up being Gareth Southgate by default because he's available at the end of July but the, these well, Liverpool and Bayern and, and Barcelona you'd assume have already got a head start exactly. because, they, because they know exactly what they're going to do United at the moment, haven't made a decision on what on what they're going to do in in terms of who the, the manager is going to be. Mm-hmm. And also, you can't leave. You can't say it's going to be based on qualify for the Champions League. It's going to be based on winning the FA Cup. You can't leave it that late. You know, big clubs need to make, like you say, hard-headed decisions and make decisions quickly to give yourself a head start. Do you think they want an English manager? Is there a pro- there seem to be the senior appointments? You know, Jason Wilcox, Dan Ashworth. They seem to be going down a. And that was the whole Potter thing as well, wasn't it? Because I, I keep hearing that Potter feels, if United do change managers, he feels there he's got a, a shot. There was a suggestion that the, the transfer policy would not be exclusively English players, obviously, because you can't ever do that in the modern game, but it would focus in particular on English players. Mm. So you, if you extrapolate that to the managers, it's safe to assume that they would look, they would give English managers perhaps more of a look than they would do if they were just making a, a cold decision. But again, like you're talking about, Southgate, I think Potter falls into that same category. Can you sell him to Man United fans after what happened at Chelsea? Well, he couldn't handle the big club, he couldn't handle the big personalities, the big players, the big pressure. So I don't think Potter for Man United is a good fit. But you look at who's the relationship, though, isn't it? But you look at, yeah, Dan Ashworth, part of the FA DNA system. Yeah. Graham Potter came through, you know, the, the, the FA's pro licence course. So he's, he's very much kind of a, a poster boy for the FA. And I guess if England make a, ch- a change in the summer, Graham Potter would be right at the top of the list to replace Gareth Southgate. Well, it, I, I'm pretty sure that if if we go back, if um, Southgate had left earlier, I, I know pretty certain that Graham Potter was their number one choice before he went to Chelsea. The only thing is about the whole Chelsea experience with Graham Potter is that, it, I mean, so much stuff came out after he left about how much of a mess that club was. Some of it, as you say, he wasn't, he didn't really seem to be able to handle it but just only look at Pochettino who's mm. dealt in these kind of environments with um, you know ownership models that have <laughs> attracted a lot of criticism in the past most obviously at PSG but even at Spurs it was not as if um, you know he, he had an easy ride with the hierarchy there yet he is floundering at the moment at Chelsea because of just what an absolute mess that club is behind the scenes and just for Chelsea can we put this one to bed now Jose Mourinho to Chelsea they're not start, sure. No, no I, okay. can't, I can't see it. I mean, the only thing is, they're, they're, they, Todd Bowley is somebody who is actively gauging the fan reaction in the same way that Rob says United are. He, you know, if that, if that, look at Frank Lampard. Yeah. That kind of came out of nowhere. And from what I was told about how that came about, the fan chat around Lampard and they felt they needed a, you know, a club sort of bona fide legend and uh, obviously he'd managed the club before with mixed success. But they felt, OK, here's somebody who we can get the fans on side for a few months while we try to sort ourselves out. It's not impossible if those fans are singing for Mourinho every week. Well, this is the danger, as I said before, about listening to fans. I mean, you know, fans put the money in there and tell it to the save. But Jose Mourinho with a young squad of players that have got a lot to prove, it's a nightmare scenario because Jose's success in the past has been with squads that have had a lot of experience, a lot of players that he can trust. He doesn't. So, I mean, how well, these are pe- fan, the same fans, by the way, who've sung Roman Roman, which is well, yeah, exactly. in the past as well. So, uh, how much credence we place in this in terms of an actual serious yeah. strategy going but, forward? But how many how many times has Mourinho been successful with a group of young players? I mean, no, not and that that squad is just not a Mourinho squad. He'd, he'd have clashes with the owners. Great name, great for us in terms of what it brings to the Premier League. But I mean, Newcastle has been mentioned as a potential, but I, I, I'm told that Newcastle don't 
see Mourinho as a, as a I don't think anyone wants that trouble anymore, do they? Well, this is the thing. I, I think Mourinho in the Premier League is done. I don't think there's any potential. Unless he takes a short term. Unless, I don't know, say tomorrow, Chelsea sack Pochettino. And there's a short term option, you sell that to Jose. And he, for some, somehow he gets a reaction out of his players for, for four months, which he could do because he's that kind of manager who can kind of instill that fight and spirit. And then he gets a longer contract on the bait on the back of a, a very, very short spell, but it's whether he would take a short a short term deal, I don't think he would. What one one strange one doing the rounds the last couple of days is Jose to West Ham, which again I can say that. Ex Chelsea, ex Tottenham. Would the, would the West Ham I mean the West Ham would love it in the sense that it's Jose Mourinho, but obviously he's got a lot of baggage with his previous clubs, but West Ham are an ambitious club that want to take a next step. Mm. Jose Mourinho to West Ham? Well they like I know they like Tuchel. Right. And I don't think they feel they can necessarily get Tuchel cool because I think they feel he's probably out of reach for them. Yeah. For the reasons you've already said, maybe Mourinho might be in reach. He'd love to come back to London. Yeah. He obviously loves the Premier League, English football. Would he take that job if they threw enough money at him? He's had to feel he's out of money now as well, Tuchel. Cool. It's, it's a name that's been on the cards for since Ollie was manager. Him, Tuchel and Nagelsmann. But he's a top manager, isn't he? No, he is. And I remember you know, United execs at the time saying if, if they were looking for a new manager, that Nagelsmann and, and Tuchel would, would be the two that they would look at. It's a question of whether his reputation is still as high as it was three or four years ago. But also, not. the word within football for people I speak to is that Tuchel's quite difficult to manage. Well, again, we're back to that same situation, aren't you, with De Zerbi and, and Jose? I'm sure Klopp and Guardiola are, though. That's what ma successful managers are challenging yeah. managers. You know, and it takes I strong, think it's how you manage that, though, it, it takes strong directors to be able to deal with them. But you know, just one thing on Mourinho. If England falls short of the Euros and, and Gareth Southgate goes separate ways, do you hire a guy that... No. Well, let me finish before you start changing Do you hire words. a guy that... Let I mean, me finish. Listen, I, I can see the, the senior figures at the FA would run a mile from Mourinho, but maybe the senior figures at the FA need to kind of think, actually, what we need is a winner. Someone that will get a team for a tournament, tactically sound. Is it not a perfect fit for Mourinho? Obviously, it would cost a lot of money, but Southgate to Mourinho would be quite a leap. But... World Cup in 2026, the best generation of English players for a long time. You just need a guy that can put it all in place, get him a way of playing, Jose Mourinho win the World Cup for him. This is why you're not chairman of the FA, I wow. think. Wow, <laughs> wow. What, I, mean, I mean, the logic sound. I, look, I mean, I think, they'll, I think they'll go English if they can. I think they want, to, they, they want that kind of continuity. Um, the name that interests me the most if they went foreign would be Pochettino. Mm. for the simple reason that John McDermott is probably going to be picking the next England manager. And explain to people who John McDermott is. And he's the technical director of the FA, but he worked very, very closely with Pochettino at Tottenham and they retain a very good, very close working relationship. And, you know, again, you're talking about timing. Say Chelsea decide they're going to get rid of Poch in the summer, Southgate leaves, there's no compensation. And look, he's only got a, he's signed a very short deal at mm. Chelsea. He's only got a year left anyway. Mm. So the FA could even consider if they wanted to go down that road. I think a chance of getting Guardiola as well, you know. You think? Yeah. He's yeah. already come that was, I don't know where that came from, but that was floated, wasn't it, that idea, not that long ago? Well, he's on record as saying that he, he wants to manage at a World Cup or a, a major tournament. He, there aren't that many countries that he, that he would, that he could look at and go, could I be successful with that group of players? Um, I think that from what you wear behind the scenes, I think the England job, if it came at the right time, would interest him. And I, and I don't know whether his skill set would, would transfer to an international team. Obviously, that's not one for me, it's one for him. He obviously has got his eye on these national teams. I, I, I think if the timing was right, and he'd done everything he wanted to do at City, and it was time to walk away, and the, the England job was there, I think there's more than half a chance that, that that could happen at some stage. You can't spend 200 million on full-backs in international football, though, can you? <laughs> well, no, true. But you get, but you could be put in charge. Of, you could be put in charge of the entire, not the structure, but the entire way that the all the age groups are coached. You you could give him quite a lot of authority over the way that that is managed, and I think that might appeal to him. The same with the US job. I, I'm not I'm sure that he, he wouldn't take the US job. I think he, I think he'd love the idea of being the the Johan Cruyff of American football. So Cruyff went to Barcelona, yeah, transformed definitely. everything. Pep. We know he had his kind of sabbatical year in, in, in New York when he was between Barcelona and Bayern Munich. I think if you could sell to Pep Guardiola, there's, there's lots of money and ambition in the US. Say to Pep, look, become the guy that rips all up for us in the US, tell us what we need to do, you, everything, all the resources you want to turn the US into the most dominant force in world football. I think that would really appeal to Pep Guardiola. I, See, don't, I, I don't think you get that with England. No. Because they've got, they've got this England DNA, they've obviously built St George's Park, it's been going 10 odd years. They feel they're on the results would suggest, even at youth level, when they're winning tournaments, that they are on a path that is now yielding success. I think, look, if Guardiola seriously 
wanted the England job, they'd obviously consider it. It'd be a, it'd be a fascinating watch. If they turn up to see what he'd do. Graham Potter, I'm sorry, the, the, the <laughs> FA would deserve not no offence to Graham Potter, but we're talking about Guardiola. Yeah, of course. Just one big transfer or not, one big sign that's already happened is Michael Edwards going back to Liverpool in a kind of a senior role, more senior than director of football, but he's going to be the guy that will lead the search for a new coach ahead of Jurgen Klopp and also appoint a technical director beneath him. Now, we know that Michael Edwards has had massive success at Liverpool in the past. Does this give a kind of indications to how important it is now to get a proper technical director, football director or director of whatever you want to call it, somebody who's running the football side of the club? I just don't think you can survive as a top club without that kind of structure in place. And it's interesting that they've made those decisions or those appointments before the manager because the one thing that, I mean, you'll know as well, Oggy, when United, when Fergie left United, the one thing they said it wasn't just that Fergie left, it was that David Gill had been there for years and years, left at the same time and you left with a, a brand new manager, with a brand new chief exec, and the whole thing just fell apart. The thing about Edwards is, he's obviously he's not he's a new appointment, but not a new appointment. He's already been there, so he he knows the club, he knows the the the, the stuff that he's put in place there. That's that's um, that's that's still there. It's quite a smart move, really. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that Liverpool are learning the mistakes that United made. With, no, with, but I, I think there's an element of the fact that United lost this massive brain trust and appointed a lack of brain trust to be polite in terms of David Moyes and, and Edward. Michael Edwards is a guy that I've been told he's got. It's, it's not this, everyone thinks he's the data guy. He, he was the data guy and he still probably is, but he's also the network guy in the sense that he can pick up the phone to anybody in Europe, anybody in the world, and he, he has a great knowledge base of what's happening right now, who the players are, who the coaches are. He will know who Liverpool's next manager is already. He, he will know the person out there that is the perfect fit for Liverpool. And it may not be Xabi Alonso in the sense that Alonso has a different team at Bayer Leverkusen, different style of play different focus on his personality. Michael Edwards will know A, B and C. When they appointed Jurgen Klopp, he spent, he spent months scouting Klopp. He actually, I was told a story whereby he, he actually went on a, a European trip with Dortmund and just checked into the same hotel as a team. Didn't let anybody know that he was there. And he just basically had his breakfast, just watched Klopp around his players and, and watched how he interacted with his coaches and his staff and just got a sense of his personality, his presence. And that was part of his kind of fact file building to, to when he appointed Klopp to replace Brendan Rodgers. So this is what he's all about. He's about real detail, knowing exactly who the people are that should be appointed. So I don't think Liverpool will come out next week and say we've appointed this coach, but I'm pretty sure from this point on, the guy that they want will be in their sights. We need to find out who he's having breakfast with then. Exactly. That's the key. I need to uh, just follow Michael Lebers around Europe now. Maybe even South America. <laughs> if you were Alonso, where would you go? If I was Jeb Alonso, I would... Uh, I'd probably go to Bayern Munich, because I think... I think Liverpool, there's, there's too much emotion attached and like we were saying before, following Klopp is just like, it is an impossible job because you've, got all, you've also got the issue with Virgil van Dijk's 32 now, Mo Salah's got a year left on his contract. You're basically arriving at Liverpool when potentially that team is going to be broken up. Well, Salah will go, won't he? I, I, surely they'll sell Salah. If, 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 if the Saudis offer 200 million or anything like that. Certainly on Saudis, like, like top, but if top you're, list. Yeah, you're right, but if, if you're Liverpool and you set the new coach, We've got this massive kind of earthquake with Jurgen Klopp leaving. We're going to have a second treadmill with more Salah leaving. Yeah, but you could say you you could look at that the other way though and say right, we're we're going to yes we're going to sell Mo Salah yes it's but we're going to sell it as he's got one year left he's what is he thirty one thirty two yeah. it's life changing money mm. club changing money and we're going to give you all of it to reinvest in mm. the squad. You are then saying to a new manager, well you can go in not necessarily reshape the whole squad in your own image but you can make an immediate impact and they could do that. Look, the Saudis I, from what I'm sure you guys are hearing the same they're going to splash the cash mm. big again this summer get the powder dry in January it sounds like the, the PIF are going to go hard again in the summer for a lot of top European players so that deal could happen really quickly it could happen really early yeah. if Liverpool want it to they say right get the money in right at the start of the window if we can get our manager in July 1st know our targets and mm. spend that money so come August we've got some of those players ideally all of them on a pre-season and we can integrate them and hit the ground running whether you sign one or two or three or however you want to do it but at least it, you could at least sell it then to a new manager as you've got the funds to, to try and shape this squad and take it beyond the Klopp era. And not, you're not just inheriting something and trying, you know, the old vase across a marble floor. You're not doing that. You're actually turning it into your own I, I, I'd go the other way. I'd throw everything at keeping Mo Salah. I just think he's only 31. Look at Messi and Ronaldo. They're late 30s now and they're both performing at a high level. Salah is a brilliant athlete, looks after himself really well and he's just... You know, you, you can talk about the greatest players the Premier League's ever seen, and you, you talk about 
Thierry Henry, you talk about Eric Cantona, Mo Salah's in that bracket. Mo, Mo Salah for Liverpool has been as influential as any of those guys for, for you know, Cantona at United yeah. and Henry for Arsenal. And I just don't think you, you, you kind of say, yeah, you know, you're 31, you've got your left in this contract, let you go. I, I'd do everything to keep him because the new coach can build his new team around Mo Salah because he's such a, such a great player. But with PSR as it is now, could you realistically as a Liverpool say we're going to potentially allow him to run his deal down and lose him for nothing a year later because if because mm. I hear what you're saying but if the Saudis don't game this summer what do you think they're going to do next summer? They've got to give a new contract this summer they have to They're say, going to offer him hideous yeah. money in yeah. the signing on fee and a personal contract it will be in but Liverpool, very difficult to turn that down for his most salary if he's offered just a straight contract with, you know, obviously Liverpool's no gamble last summer was that it was like the money was massive, £150 million, pounds, and they could have done exactly that. They could have been killing Mbappe with that sort of money. Mm. Well, their gamble was, we want to keep Salah so that we can challenge for the title. And that's exactly what they're doing. So I think this summer, banish uncertainty, get the new coaching, and day one, give, give more Salah a new contract and say, right, this is our forward, this is our path forward, and this is how we're going to do it. Again, it's about timing, isn't it? It's whether you can, can you lose Klopp and Salah in the same summer. Maybe if Klopp was staying, you say, well, this is a time to kind of regenerate the squad. You take the £150 million, you invest the money in the squad. And move on. But I mean, you'll remember Gareth Bale at Tottenham, they completely wasted it. Yeah. They wasted it's not a guarantee it. having the money. Definitely. Well, they diluted the quality, didn't they? They've signed seven players, of which I think only from memory Christian Eriksen worked out, mm. really. There were one or two. Lamella, you could argue, was a pass mark, but the rest were all you know, yes. Paulinho, Soldado, I can't remember. They were and that's a gamble, isn't it? That, it? You keep the great player, or do you take the money for the great player and hope that the, the mm. players that come in and are anywhere near as good as. It's also about Salah as well. Does he want to be part of another? what is going to ultimately be a rebuild at his age. He might just look at it and think, well, I've done everything. I've won the Premier League, won the Champions League. What is there left for me to achieve? You're talking about life, life-changing money. It's life-changing money even for a man who doesn't need to worry about money ever again. Mm. might look at it and think, Klopp's gone. Time to go. Mm.